Hello, my name is Jennifer Ferreira and welcome to another Gran Entrevista. A former trustee for the Toronto District School Board, our guest today has been active in the political arena for years now. She served as president of Canada's new Democratic Party before her election as member of provincial parliament for the riding of Davenport earlier this year. Here to talk more about her involvement with the NDP and provincial politics is Marit Stiles. Thank you so much for joining us today, Marit. It's a real pleasure. If we could start by reflecting over the past two months or so since the provincial elections, what has that experience been like for you? Well, it's been amazing. Uh, first of all, uh, obviously being elected as the member for provincial parliament for Davenport is a, is a great honor. Um, so I've been very excited about filling that role. And, uh, but it's been also a really busy few months because while at the same time we're starting to set up our offices as new members of provincial parliament uh, and, and get out into our communities, we are also, we're faced with a legislat the Legislative Assembly being called back. And right. so we've actually had a quite a busy few months of uh, dealing with work in the legislature. Okay. Now, this is your first time serving as MPP, specifically for the New Democratic Party, but you have been involved with the party in another capacity as well. Tell us about your role as president. Right, well, I was elected a couple of years ago. I for, sat for two years as the president of the federal New Democratic Party, Canada's NDP. And I was there during a really important part of our history when we were electing a new leader who eventually we elected. It was Jagmeet Singh, of course. Right. And uh, it was a really interesting uh, period for me. I was able to uh, represent the party uh, across Canada and, and do a lot of the important organizing work that I think we need in order to be ready to hopefully form government in the next uh, federal election. Now, the last time the NDP served as the official opposition within the province of Ontario was back in 1987, I believe, with Bob Ray before he had gone on to, to right. be premier. So what has it been like for you being a part of history? It's been amazing. I mean, also, in addition to the fact that there's only been, I think, one other time when we've, we formed official opposition, we're the largest official opposition in, I think, 35 years. So it's been a really important important and exciting time for us. We have uh, 40 MPPs. Uh, we uh, are a very strong opposition, I think, which is great too. A lot of the incumbent MPPs who were re-elected again are amazing and strong. And of course, our leader, Andrea Horvath, who performed incredibly well during the campaign. And we're all very proud of the work she's done. And she's just uh, doing a terrific job taking on Doug Ford and the Ford government uh, in the legislature. But there's also a lot of new people like me who I think are bringing some new skills, some new ideas, and new energy uh, into the role of official opposition. Right. What is the value in having these new members and constantly recreating a political party? Well, I, first of all, I think it's the only way that we start to in any way represent the communities we actually represent, right? We have to elect more women, we have to elect more diverse people into, the, uh, into our caucuses, into our parties, and so having new people, and in our case, many new women, more than half of our caucus is now female, a very exciting uh, change, and a lot of young people. I mean, uh, myself, I'm, I've got two teenagers, but there are a lot of young women that were elected in this, uh, in this uh, election for the NDP, uh, they come with really interesting experiences from all different backgrounds and to me that's what really enriches our party but also our opposition in government. Right. Looking specifically at Davenport it's no secret that it's the riding in Ontario with the highest percentage yes. of ethnic Portuguese constituents yes. I believe in all of Canada. Yes I think that's true. And so what has your experience been like in terms of interacting with Portuguese community members? Well I've lived in the riding of Davenport for 20 years so uh, my knowledge and experience in the community is pretty deep. Uh, um, I, I have always really valued the fact that I live in a community that has such a large and vibrant Portuguese community. It really is. And I was thinking today as I came to Brampton for this interview that even though many people in the Portuguese community are now living all over the place, Davenport was really the heart and remains the heart of the community in many ways. It's where we do a lot of the biggest celebrations around Portugal Day. Little Portugal. A little Portugal is still there. And, and many of our the small businesses that are still in the community are still run by the Portuguese community. 
But it is also a changing community, and I think um, much of my experience in dealing with the community in, in my riding, um, it is uh, a lot of older people now, and they're frustrated, right? They're frustrated with things like the affordability of things, they're frustrated with the cost of housing and hydro, and they're worried that maybe their children and grandchildren will not be able to continue to live in the city the way that they grew up. So that's, that's I think, the downside, but the upside is, of course, the culture, the music, the food, <laughs> which of I'm course. a big Big fan of, of and uh, and a very vibrant and important community in our city. You spoke about some of the concerns, especially pertaining to perhaps some of the older constituents. Now, I know that you held a town hall meeting earlier this month yes. uh, within the riding of Davenport. What were some of the major issues? You mentioned just now things like the affordability of, of housing and whatnot. What were some of the other issues brought forward? Well. It was really, a, um, the main reason we held the town hall was in response to the um, the, the government, and in this case, the Doug Ford government, uh, kind of dictatorial <laughs> approach to how they were handling municipal elections and the changes to municipal elections in Toronto. Okay. That was our main focus, was that chain, that what we were calling an assault or an attack on local democracy. Okay. Um, so that was the main reason why we held that town hall. But what I heard from people, the kinds of questions we got were around cuts to um, Ontario Disability, Ontario Works. People are really concerned about schools, the lack of school repairs, the fact that the government is now cutting another 100 million dollars from school repairs that was a big issue um, and health care uh, which is an issue that we continue to hear about in the community um, concerns about waiting lists the hallway medicine and now of course concerns that the Ford government in the election talked about further cuts what's that going to mean for the quality of health care and access to health care in our communities and also particularly long-term care right one of the other I would say main topics of the town hall meeting was on sexual education mm -hmm. and the changes being proposed to that. Can you talk a little bit about some of those changes? Well, the Ford government is saying that they want to revert back to what was the previous uh, curriculum um, that teaches health and physical education, which includes sexual education. And so that means going back to the 1998 curriculum, mm -hmm. which truthfully is is not really keeping up with today. So we have concerns and I'm, the people that came to my town hall had big concerns about the fact that it's not talking about things like the changes in technology, cyberbullying, um, same-sex families, um, and it's not addressing some of the, the issues we know that exist out there, that, that the challenges that LGBTQ youth uh, face in our community, things like that. So it's a very out of date curriculum. It doesn't deal with a lot of the issues that kids today are facing and that we need to talk about. And so the government's talking about reverting to that curriculum. And uh, we think that's actually putting a lot of young people at risk. What is the value in discussing things like same sex marriage and, and cyberbullying? Why are these things so important to include in the sexual education curriculum? Well, first of all, back in 1998 when that curriculum was developed, uh, same sex marriage wasn't legal in Canada. So that's a big one. Um, but also, we know that, that we need to provide support to kids um, who, are, uh, who are gay, lesbian, uh, queer youth. We need to support them so that they're not forced back into the closet, so that they're not suffering from depression. We know that's actually a real risk in those kids' lives. Um, we know that families are different and that we need to acknowledge that as a society. But also, you know, 1998, I mean, we didn't have video cell phones. Uh, kids weren't on YouTube uh, looking up whatever they wanted to. So, so we didn't have social media the same way we do now. So all of these these technologies have really impacted uh, what children are being exposed to. And it's really important that we prepare our kids um, and that we educate them in an appropriate way um, as they're heading out into the world. It's what's going to keep them safe and healthy in the long term. How is the NDP working towards counteracting this mm -hmm. uh, intention essentially to revert back to the 1998 curriculum? We have asked, and I was in, in the legislature um, asking many questions of the Premier and the Minister of Education. Uh, please, we, we begged them not to revert to the previous curriculum because it's not safe. It's not, um, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be healthy for our kids. Uh, the government wants to conduct consultations with parents. They promised they were gonna do that during the election. I, that's fine. They can go ahead and do that, but we need to know that our kids in the meantime are receiving, you know, at least the curriculum that they were receiving um, in, that was developed in 2015. And I think to do anything else is really irresponsible, and I think there's going to be a lot of legal challenges as well. 
Going back to Davenport, what initiatives do you hope to put in place over the next few years for constituents in that riding? Well, one of the things that I really believe in is is having excellent service to the community. Um, so I will go to the legislature and I will ask questions of the premier and I will be out there talking about those issues. But back home in the riding, um, it's really important that the community has an office they can come to, um, have uh, regular meetings in the community, uh, town halls on issues that are really important and, and, and critical and, and timely, but also that we provide certain services for them like tax clinics and other things that make it a little bit easier for people who might not otherwise be able to access those services to get them directly in our neighborhood, in our community. So I'm planning to do a lot more of town halls and outreach and also to bring, because not everybody will be able to even get to my office, which by the way is at 1199 Bloor Street West, right on the, the near the Dufferin subway. But we're going to do uh, roving um, constituency office dates as well in other parts of the riding to make it a little easier for people to get uh, to meet with my staff and I'm really excited that I've hired some excellent staff who will be able to uh, provide uh, case by case um, support to members of the community. Okay. Now, Mara, we were talking about some of the concerns brought forward by constituents at your town hall meeting, and one of these concerns in particular was the sort of shakeup in democracy when it came to Toronto City Councillors and the provincial government's decision to slash the number of councillors from 47 to 25. Um, what are your thoughts? I'm very opposed to it. Um, I have uh, some significant concerns. Uh, first of all, about how it's being Im introduced. Uh, I think um, that uh, Doug Ford is acting like a dictator, uh, coming in and just because he has the right to change municipal elections the way they're conducted in Toronto doesn't mean he should. Uh, certainly without speaking to the people of this city, to say that he's consulted is not true. There has been no conversation about it. And then to introduce it while the election is really technically already underway, I think was very underhanded. So I'm, I'm very concerned about what this means uh, in terms of uh, what is an attack on our local democracy in Toronto, but I'm also really concerned about what it will mean if it, if it actually goes ahead, because I think it will impact the kind of service, the quality of service and the quality of representation that our residents in the city of Toronto have come to expect. Now, one of the reasons behind this decision according to the Conservative government, mm -hmm. is the fact that it will save money for the province. They're throwing around the number $25 million. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is an accurate number? No, and I, I actually, I, I questioned the Premier around that number. I, I don't understand where he got $25 million. But at the end of the day, um, the, the lack of service, the, the lack, any, any staff that are cut or anything like that is going to be, I think, the expense is going to be seen in what city staff have to do to keep up. <laughs> you know, we're going to see that money spent elsewhere in order to keep up with, with citizens' concerns. We're also going to, I think, see some pretty significant expenses in terms of the actual conduct of the election because these things are quite expensive and to change everything at this stage is going to cost a lot of money. So I haven't seen any new numbers, but I, I think 25 million is, uh, I don't know where he got that number. I think in the end, we're actually going to find this, um, this new system more costly. So this idea of cutting the number of city councillors, is it something that the NDP might have considered as a way to potentially save money within the province? Um, well, it's certainly nothing we were looking at. Um, in fact, we're very concerned about, again, what this will mean to the quality of service. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's the provincial government's uh, responsibility or role to okay. tell the city of Toronto uh, how they should be organizing themselves. The city of Toronto did go through as well, like a two-year process of consultation, uh, which was which was also um, taken to the Ontario Municipal Board at one point. Um, so there were many attempts to, to talk to the public, to get input, and they came up with um, a, a number of 47 city councillors. That was a long process. So for the provincial government to come in and impose their version of what makes good government on the city, I think is very unfair to the city of Toronto and our residents. This is also really, I think, more about a personal attack uh, by uh, Mr. Ford, unfortunately. I think he has some personal grievances um, with the city of Toronto from his days as a city councillor, and, and, and we've said that very uh, publicly. And I think taking that kind of personal vendetta and imposing it on our city uh, is, is really, uh, I think, 
I would expect more from the Premier of this province. One of the consequences of this sort of shakeup in ward boundaries is that the Toronto District School Board as well as Toronto Catholic mm. District School Board, all school boards within the city essentially, are being forced to realign their trustee ward boundaries with mm -hmm. the city's new boundaries. And so I'd like to know sort of your thoughts on this. Uh, do you think this might spark more changes for the school boards within the city, within the province? Right, so the same sort of thing is going to happen, it, not quite as an extreme impact as what you're seeing with City Council, but yes, um, the school, the, the ward that I represented previously, um, I was responsible for 17 schools in my area that were public school boards, right. uh, public school board schools. That number will now be 34 for one school board trustee, and school board trustees are not, a, it's not a full-time role, it's not paid as a full-time role, it's most school board trustees really have to have another job in order to survive and make ends meet, so uh, I think it's going to be very difficult for school trustees to fulfill their role uh, with that kind of expanded number of schools and responsibility. Um, and at the end of the day, I, I think when we, what we really want, and it's the same issue with the city councillors, is we want um, our local representatives to be able to be there advocating for us and for our communities. And what we're doing is undermining that in this legislation. And I think um, as, whether it's the, your child is in the Catholic school board or the public school board, um, or it's your grandchildren, I think this is reason for concern. So it goes back to this idea of the quality of service. You mm -hmm. think that because these different trustees or counselors, whatever it be, are going to be responsible for more constituents that perhaps some of that quality might be sacrificed. It's possible. I mean, I know that everybody is going to work so hard to try to not let the community down, right? We all know that, and, and I know how hard school board trustees work, and I know how hard city councillors work. Um, and, and, you know, but I, I do think it's going to be a lot to ask of people um, to have them representing areas that are twice as large with, in, in the case of school board trustees, they don't have any assistance or anything. So, and that's fine. People have, have run for the position knowing that. Um, but I think it also impacts who can run for those jobs, right? So for example, uh, you know, women. Uh, women, young parents who have small children, um, those are the people we want to be school board trustees. We want parents to feel like they can get involved and represent our schools. That would be great if we had more young parents running for school board trustee, mm -hmm. but it's becoming increasingly difficult to do so because you have to juggle that along with taking care of your everything kids else. and everything else. So it's, I think, unrealistic. Um, and I think it is, and we're seeing that with the city council as well. I think that, um, what we're going to see increasingly is that the diversity of our city is not as well recognized in, in who's elected to city council, and um, we're making that more difficult, not easier. Toronto City Councilors recently voted to legally challenge Bill 5, otherwise known as the Better Local Government right. Act, uh, this decision to slash the number of city councilors. This idea of legally challenging the government's decision, do you think it was an appropriate response to the situation? Absolutely. I think it's the only thing they can do. Uh, this is, again, an attack on their elections, on the decisions that that city council took several years to make and put a lot of resources and energy into. Um, public consultations, research, uh, and now just being undermined um, in one fell swoop. Uh, so I think it's really important that the city council is taking um, on this legal challenge. Uh, I hope that they're successful. Uh, I think that if the government wanted to uh, change things again in this election, they should have talked about it in the provincial election so that the city people of the city of Toronto would have known what they were voting for. And I think even if they had run on that, they should have gone through a, a similar public consultation pro process. They didn't even let that bill go to committee hearings. There were no hearings. There was no public uh, opportunity for the public to be heard. And so I think that city council has a, has a responsibility. I was really pleased to see that so many city councillors voted in favour of the, of the legal challenge. Do you think the councillors will get what they're looking for? Well, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a, an expert in this area of law, uh, but I do think that there are some pretty solid arguments for the fact that this amounts to meddling in a, an election process. Uh, I've often said to people, if, if this was happening in another country and uh, one level of government started to meddle and change the rules of the game in the middle of the game, 
we would be all sit talking about the lack of democracy in that country. So I think it is actually really awful. I think it, it also sends a message uh, to the world. Uh, we talk about trying to increase investment in our country and in our province, attract local, attract business here, and we're basically sending a message that we're maybe, that, that we're quite, quite unstable actually. So um, I think meddling in those local elections at, in the moment when the game is already underway is a really big problem and I, I think that they've probably got uh, a leg to stand on uh, in terms of their legal challenge. Does the NDB have any plans to help city councillors in their fight? Well, uh, Andrea Horvath just announced that she, well, we are going to introduce some legislation to uh, around local democracy uh, to prevent this kind of thing from happening ever again. Uh, we've certainly been fighting it um, when the legislature was in session. We will continue to do so. We think it's the wrong way to go, the wrong direction. So we'll keep fighting it. Um, but we're also going to try to bring forward some legislation so that we can prevent this from happening in the future. Uh, cities, uh, municipalities have to have the ability to determine how many, you know, what the proper uh, direction is for them in terms of their elections. And I mean, this also applies to the regional municipalities where you've seen the um, elections, have been, cut, the elections right? are being canceled uh, and are now just going to be appointed again, those chairs. And I think that, um, again, is, is a very undemocratic move. Nobody was really consulted. Um, so at very least, cities need to be consulted properly before um, any changes are made. So what exactly might this legislation look like? Is it a matter of ensuring that in the future consultations will be had or is it a matter of just preventing any kind of interference on the municipal level by other levels of government? What, what can we expect from this piece of legislation? Well, I haven't seen the details of the bill yet. It was just announced. Uh, so we'll wait and see what she's going to put forward. But certainly the main, the main, the most important piece is that municipalities have to have a say. Uh, the residents of the municipality need to have a say and need to be heard. They need to be consulted. Their voices need to be heard. This, the province has the right. They have the right to make changes doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Just because you have the right to change something doesn't mean you shouldn't listen to what the people think first. And so this move is very undemocratic. Um, it's, again, I, I really believe that uh, the Premier is acting like a dictator here. Uh, I would expect better. Um, but if he's going to behave in that way, then we need to bring forward legislation that's going to make it difficult for him to do that again in the future. Okay. Thank you so much for your time today, Mara. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's, it's wonderful to be here. My name is Jennifer Ferreira. Thank you so much for joining us for yet another Gran Entrevista. Have a great night.